Uh, Chris is North American Director at the World Business Council for Sustainable, De <laughs> for sustainable Development. I say that twice. Uh, Chris manages his organization's relationship with Fortune 500 companies in North America and leads their Redefining Capital Markets engagement program, which helps WBCSD members engage on ESG issues in the financial sector. Chris is going to discuss sustainable development goals as they, they relate to CEOs and business and share other insights about trends about ESG data. Chris. Thank you. So it's nice to see my um, former uh, colleagues at Ernst & Young are still uh, doing such good work. So uh, thank you, Emily. Um, so I, I titled this Next Era of Sustainability, and maybe I'm aging myself, but I, I felt like I've lived through about four eras of sustainability. And this one's come along a lot quicker than I think we would have anticipated. And what I mean by that is I would say the first era, and I started off my career in the environmental space as an environmental lawyer, um, and knowing now how not to solve environmental problems um, on Superfund and asbestos cases, that was very much a command and control approach. Thou shalt clean up and thou shalt um, you know, um, pay whatever it's going to cost, but just get it done. And then um, there was kind of a movement in late 90s, early 2000s about market mechanisms, and that was the Kyoto Protocol, right? And it was this whole feeling that the way to solve things was to let the markets actually evaluate and create pricing. And that seemed to be like a brief flicker of time, in a sense, that, that was just, uh, it seemed so possible, and then just kind of flickered out. And then I would say most of the, the years over the Bush years and then uh, the Obama years were really trying to convince business that this was relevant, that this was something that they needed to be involved in. How do you make the business case was repeatedly asked. And I think you know, this was moving now with the, the Paris Accord, for instance, to a feeling that, okay, now government is going to you know, show the way, business is going to follow, and we're going to have you know, kind of a smooth transition. Obviously, there's been some hiccups, particularly here um, in, in, in the U.S. on that. And I think business is ready, I would say. I would say business is ready to uh, step into the breach, and I'll, I'll tell you why. Um, let's see if I know how to work this. There we go. So just a very quick thumbnail on the World Business Council. We have a terrible acronym, by the way, WBCSD, but um, that's even worse than the name. Um, so uh, we're 200 global companies, we're about 22 years old, and the reason we were formed, and this is just kind of, uh, I think, useful when we look at the SDGs in a few minutes, is that um, a number of uh, CEOs went to the Rio Summit in 92, and they, um, they got there, and then they weren't allowed in to any of the discussions. Why? Because at that time, the UN had um, maybe a potentially official stakeholders, but business was not seen as one of them was not seen as relevant. And yet, from the CEO's point of view, they went because they said, well, whatever is going to be decided here, we're going to have to implement. And so they said, well, we now need kind of a business voice. And so a few years later, they formed the World Business Council. Um, and the, I guess the other quick thing to note is that when companies join us, they join on the CEO level. So we like to say we, we speak with the CEO voice. Um, and that the uh, organization is truly global. We don't lobby on any individual country basis, but we, you could say we lobby on anything that's on the UN basis. And so I wanted to mention, and you're going to see in the next couple of slides, I kind of talk about a change in business uh, climate. And I'm, I'm struck by an experience I had early on in my career when I was at a, a reinsurance company at Swiss Re, where um, I was very excited. I got to present to the board. And um, we had just rolled out a whole initiative about what we were going to do about incorporating what we believed on climate change and sustainability into our business line. So I was very excited. I got on the elevator. And on the elevator is Paul Volcker, who was on our board. And I hear him talking to one of the other board members, and he's mumbling. He says, look at this agenda. They're wasting half the day on the weather. And as a reinsurance company, that actually shocked me, right? Because we had climatologists on staff. We had climatologists on staff since the 80s. And we truly believed in what you know, we said, that climate change was the single greatest long-term threat to us. 
Um, but to see that from a board member, this did not seem to even raise, you know, rise to the level of attention or you know, it was a waste of his time was really striking to me. And I think that we're seeing now a real change in that. So 2016, year of optimism, right? 2015 looked so good. Um, we had the um, Paris Accords, we had the SDGs. Um, there was seen to be a commitment on top by all the major economies um, to move forward. Um, India and China were, were in the mix, right? In the, under the Kyoto Protocol, they weren't. They didn't have a commitment. But uh, with Paris, there was uh, you know feeling that everyone was going to do their bit. And so optimism was everywhere. And to, you know, to, to talk a little bit about it, why was Paris a success? Well, Paris was a success, we think, because um, not only was, was the science settled, you had years and years of the IPCC, right, um, basically putting out reports showing where the science had progressed, where it was, and arguably, and, and there's obviously a few people that would still argue that the science is settled, but for the most part, the science was very clear. It was a time to act and a need to act. That certainly was a motivation for the delegates from the 185 countries, but as well as there was a business commitment to act. And there was some real brilliant work done, uh, BSR and uh, Ceres and a lot of other um, of our kind of our counterparts out there in making clear swim lanes for how business could actually get their message across to the national leaders. And that really moved the needle. We know that because we worked very closely with the French government and they, they said that this was unprecedented for business leaders to go in, be part of the UN system. They were in the blue zone, which in UN terms mean you were in the mix. You were actually not where they were in Rio. They were actually part of the discussions. And that made such a big difference. And then the SDGs came out. And what one CEO had said to us, which I thought was kind of interesting, he says, you know, for the first time, I actually understand what sustainability is. It's these 17 things. And so they actually put a, a bucket around sustainability, which for a lot of people just seemed like an amorphous topic. Anything could be included under sustainability. And so um, for those that don't know about the SDGs, 193 countries um, agreed to, on, on the SDGs, and it was launched in 2015. Every year to 2030, there will be a check-in, and the mo most recent check-in is the high-level political forum in July. Um, where basically the countries will get together and talk about how things are progressing on the SDGs. Very interestingly, business is at the table. There's a CEO day where CEOs can make commitments and we were pro privileged to get the opportunity to create a CSO day as the implementers, so the chief sustainability officers as the implementers and how they actually are encountering this. And we don't want to hear about what they have achieved so much, but what are they doing internally? How do you get HR involved? Because if sustainability is going to be anything going forward, it has to be holistic. It can't be owned by the sustainability ghetto in one part of the company. It has to be belonged to everyone. But then came 2017. And I'll leave it at that. Um, obviously, Brexit started the trend in, in 2016. Um, Edelman in, at the World Economic Forum released their um, annual trust barometer. And you, you can see here, CEOs were only 37% basically trusted, which was only a little bit better than government officials. And we heard this from our members repeatedly. We know this is now a problem. We know we need to deal with it. And certainly sectors, um, certain sectors are actually more highly regarded. Um, the ICT sector was mentioned earlier as uh, something like 71% approval. But the idea being that business was also seen as not doing its bit or not doing enough. And um, I think that has been a real clear wake-up call that we're seeing now as we get into 2017 further and further, that business is recognizing this is their moment to shine, in my opinion. Um, but what we're also seeing is a change of potentially global leadership. Um, we had, um, obviously, the U.S. elections, but China, for the first time, was invited to speak at the World Economic Forum, the premier. And China has made it very clear that they are going to do their bit on, on uh, the Paris Accords. And Governor Brown from California, I don't know if anybody saw this, but the day that uh, President Trump made his announcement on pulling out of Paris, he got on a plane and flew to Beijing. And there's potentially now talk of, a, of, a, of a, an agreement between California and um, China on uh, basically uh, having maybe a common market for trading emissions. 
So what, you know, what were the big trends that kind of caused these storm clouds to come? Well, it was obviously the jobs. We, we, we know the story very well. Um, but it's also the fear of automation. Um, it's the um, fragmentation, I would say, of initiatives. One of the real um, problems, I would say, in uh, those of us who were in the sustainability world from the NGO side, is, is that we're too finely sliced. I used to hear this all the time from businesses that we don't know how to deal with you because you, you have this little sliver that you're working on, this one has this little sliver, and if you would talk to our CEO, who's quite provocative, by the way, um, he, would, he would blame that on the philanthropic world. He thinks the philanthropic world has created a monster of too many finely sliced initiatives, and, and therefore there isn't anything that can get built to scale. And I think that's one of the reactions we have seen from business. They love the idea of the We Mean Business initiative that came into Paris, where there was these clear swim lanes for all the business um, NGOs. And what we're seeing, I think, is really a movement um, where business is saying, you know, we want to move on. We know we need partners. And that's obviously, um, you know, SDG 17. They know, you know, there's a partnership need and a need to scale. And we're finding, a, I would say, unprecedented collaboration. So on the trust, um, the trust basis is obviously uh, President Trump pulled us out of the Paris Accord last week. What was interesting was the instant reaction, and this was already mentioned, so I'll just, I won't go belabor it, but the instant reaction on Twitter, and one of the things I thought was most interesting was that Goldman Sachs' CEO, Lloyd um, Blankfein, his first tweet ever was um, in response to this, that this was, uh, you know, uh, that the U.S. was giving up uh, global leadership. And it was, it was really striking. Um, I would say also, though, what was interesting to me is that you'd be hard pressed, I think, to find a publicly traded, you know, Fortune 1000 type company that actually overtly would say they supported the decision and or um, would say that they don't believe in climate change. It's become part of the culture almost for, the, for businesses now to say that they, they need to act and they believe they need to act. Exxon, even though they were battling the shareholders, also came out um, very affirmatively um, in support of the Paris Accord. So I think the weather forecast is more like this now, going uh, from in, further into 2017 into 2018. And um, you know the, the litany of companies is amazing that have been coming out very affirmatively and saying that they are you know moving forward with their plans. They're all global companies; they have to. You know, business hates uncertainty, and one of the things that perhaps the U.S. pulling out of um, Paris means is now there's potentially two systems. They don't like that, especially the global businesses. They want a kind of a certain. Um, approach because who knows this may change in the U.S. in four years or eight years. So they would prefer to have had a kind of a global standard and global approach. Um, I think there's this new initiative called We Are a Still In initiative, which would be uh, bearing watch because I think that is going to start maybe having individual companies commit to continue to be um, honor the Paris Accord and do their their part based on whatever the calculations would be. So one of the key um, elements I would say that has come out this year is the recommendations of the Task Force on Climate Related Financial Disclosure. This was led by um, Mayor Bloomberg. Um, and this was, uh, I shouldn't say, it, he chaired it. Um, it was the Bank of England, Mark Carney, who, who actually, whose idea it was. And if you want to read any speech, his tragedy of the common speech is, is really well worth reading in, in the, um, that he gave in Paris in 2015. Um, but what basically he said is, as a central banker, uh, and he was also chair of the central bankers uh, of the G8, he said, you know, what's interesting, he says, we, even central bankers, deal basically quarter to quarter, or even that maybe we look a year out or two years out. But most of the, the issues, the long-term issues, the systemic issues, are much longer term. And if you look at climate change, that certainly is the case. You know, the, there needs to be planning beyond just the, the foreseeable horizon, but maybe five years out, ten years out. And going back to my early career, that was one of the early benefits I had working for a reinsurance company. That was our nature to look that way. And I think that what the task force is, is suggesting is that you know, this needs to have board oversight because it can't be at the whim of the average CEO, right? Because the CEO may be only there five years. 
Um, the idea is if it stays on the board level, it stays as a continuity. And therefore, every year there should be a continuation of or an update in the long-term strategy. That's what BlackRock's calling for. That's what State Street's calling for. Um, and interestingly, you're seeing that there was a lot of shareholder resolutions this year, and uh, two of which was really noteworthy was Occidental, which was got a majority vote saying that um, they wanted Occidental to conduct a, two, um, a scenario planning of a, a world with a two degree increase in temperature. Um, and that's after management said that they didn't want to support that. But you think about it, management's only management because 51% of the shares support them, right? So if they're actually now saying, the shareholders are saying that management perhaps has a longer term fiduciary duty maybe, um, there is um, a concern there that um, maybe management isn't looking in the right directions. And then an Exxon Mobil with 62%. Interesting, and I'm just going to mention this one other thing, was that I found the Wall Street Journal showed the, the largest um, asset managers and the percentage of the asset managers that um, they had voted with dissident shareholders. And it was stunning. 44% of the time, Fidelity votes with dissident shareholders. Fidelity, right? I mean, everyone's 401k. Um, BlackRock, 34%. State Street, 32%. So something really to, uh, noteworthy there. Um, this was a, a seminal report that also came out this year. Our CEO and our chairman actually were both involved in this. Our chairman is uh, Paul, um, Paul Pullman from Unilever. And the idea of this was to look at the SDGs and say, okay, what is the potential? How do we make the business case? And what's really interesting about the SDGs, and I should have mentioned this earlier, is that the SDGs are universally applicable for all countries. This is not the Millennium Development Goals, which were basically about helping certain countries develop. The SDGs, if you look at all 17 of them, or all 16 of them, um, there is something for every country. And so what may be, uh, where Japan may be a leader in, in, in 12 of the 16, there may be a few areas where they're not. And they're, they're considered almost a developing country in the UN eyes. Um, on these SDGs, and I think that's really noteworthy, and in a sense, every country has to be involved or engaged in them. Um, but basically, what this report tries to do is translate uh, global needs and ambitions into business aspirations or business solutions, and they estimate that there's about a $12 trillion a year potential over the next 15 years um, for, um, the, uh, for the business community with 380 million jobs potential. And uh, I won't belabor this, but this is uh, basically the, the sectors that they see. So food and agriculture, 2.3 trillion potential year in and year out. Cities and urban mobility, 3.7 trillion. Health and well-being, 1.8 trillion. And just to, to give you an idea about what the, com the companies we're working with, how they're trying to approach the SDGs. Right, SDGs seem quite, uh, uh, daunting, right? There's uh, the 17 goals and there's 160 sub goals and, uh, you know, it, how do you deal with that? How do you get your hands around it? And so what we decided to do was rather than focus on individual goals, we decided to focus on the ecosystems that would affect the majority of the goals. And so these four ecosystems are food, materials, which is circular economy, energy, and cities. And just to give you an idea on, on, the, on the food and ag side. So on the food and ag side, if you asked me about that when I first joined WBCSD three years ago, we had nothing, nothing on the food and ag side. Um, in fact, very few members. Um, now, uh, three years later, we have six separate programs, um, one on climate smart agriculture, one on global agribusiness, one on um, fresh, which I'm gonna mention in a minute, and then uh, soft commodities. And what was interesting, the soft commodities, I'm heading that one up, is that the four leading trading companies have joined uh, to work with us to look at, they know there is now threats or, or issues that they have to deal with both in the production side, of where they get soybean and, and, and things like that, as well as from the consumer products goods companies who are saying, increasingly consumers are telling us we want um, you know, organic, we want to have traceability, we have transparency, et cetera. On, on Fresh, just to give you an idea of a new initiative, is that what we're looking at with Fresh is there's a dilemma in the world. We have to feed nine billion people, right? So like climate is a, a real, um, by, by 2050, the UN estimates between nine and 10 billion people. How do we get there? Because we can't get there the way um, food is currently produced. 
Um, and what's interesting about food is science isn't settled. We don't have like what the IPCC has been able to create, which is basically a consensus around the big issues on the science. Food science is, is quite muddled. So what we've done is, in, in, in absence of saying uh, of kind of a UN initiative, is we've partnered with the EAT Foundation out of Stockholm. And the EAT Foundation is now working with some of the best scientists in the world, with the Lancet Commission, um, as well as with the Stockholm Resiliency Center. And they've identified some of the best scientists to try to identify where are the areas in food that industry business could actually affect change. And then what we're doing is then organizing business around various verticals about how do we get those business institutes to be um, involved. We have about 30 or so companies already signed up. And what's really looking um, interesting is that the areas that they're picking is obesity and it's nutrition and it's food waste. And, and so um, stay tuned on that. But I think that's the type of work you're going to see more and more. It's going to be these collaborative ventures um, in, in the spirit of the SDG uh, 17. Um, also, valuation is key, and we've heard a lot about that today, so I won't actually talk too much about it, but I like the way our CEO, when he talks about this, he's, he was a former CFO um, from a large company in the Netherlands, and he always says, you know, when I used to go for the quarterly calls, no one ever asked us about our accounting rules, which accounting rules we use, uh, should we have used something different, because he said basically it was standard, it was well developed over 100 years, right? But our language in the sustainability field is not that well developed. Um, a lot of what we report and disclose is subject to kind of more of a softer touch almost, um, at least the way the investment community sees it. And so we think that there's a huge need and, and a huge opportunity to try to figure out, you know, how do you actually put the right language that, that could be used going forward? And I'm going to mention that in a second. But what was interesting, we surveyed our 200 members, and when we looked at the, them, 81 in their sustainability reports mentioned a material sustainable risk, which is great, right? Then we looked at their quarterly reports and their annual report, and only five of those 81 actually mentioned that this is material. Now, there's some problem there, right? If it's material, then how, is, how come it's not material when you report it to the financial markets? So the common language that we're trying to develop is through the use of thinking about the idea that, um, and, and this is a statistic from the Prince of Wales Foundation, but they said basically they think about 19% of a company's true valuation comes from its financials. The rest is what maybe accountants would have used to call probably goodwill, right? The other 81%. But what, what is that if you dig into it? It's the access and use of and efficiency use of natural resources, for instance, and natural capital. For a lot of businesses, that's absolutely crucial. You can't make Coca-Cola if you don't have access to water. And yet that wouldn't have been something they would have reported on 10 years ago. Right? So the idea of the Natural Capital Protocol, which we were a partnership with, with a whole coalition of entities that came out last summer, is to try to start to use language, common language, around uh, natural capital. And then, whoops. And then, as well as we've developed, um, that came out in March, the Social Capital Protocol. Similar idea. Um, business is, uh, you know, probably most important asset um, is it's, it's talent, right? We heard this from the earlier panel. It's, it's, so how do you look at retention rates, recruitment rates, training, um, you know, human rights, and how do you put that in common language that, uh, that uh, everyone uses or could use and how it could be independently evaluated? And sorry that this comes out a little, a little gray, but this was uh, kind of an evolution, at least in our interpretation of evolution of business and sustainability. And we, we, we heard the conversation earlier about philanthropy, and philanthropy is great, and it's, it's wonderful, and that's how almost every sustainability initiative has started, right? Um, but then that had started to migrate into CSR, right? Corporate social responsibility. But that still had a ring of softness to it, right? It seemed to be, well, it's nice to do, and the company's uh, performing well, but next year, well, if it's not performing well, that could get, you know, kind of uh, curtailed. Well, that has kind of migrated into sustainability officers uh, or sustainability heads, uh, where it was look, looked at as, you know, there are certain elements, whether it's on natural capital or social capital, that actually matter to the long-term viability of the company. And we're seeing now, and we, our projection is, is that it's moving even further with the advent of chief sustainability officers, which have a seat at the table now with the other C-suites, right? 
Um, and then what we really think it needs to be is the governance piece. This has to be integrated fundamentally into corporate governance. If you look at the task force on climate related financial disclosure, that has to, for that to work, it has to be part of, uh, of corporate governance. And then eventually, we think this becomes sustainability, um, reporting, ESG issues become just part of the board's oversight. So it's not that they have a sustainability committee. A lot of companies actually have that now on the board. But this is part of the audit committee's responsibilities and other parts of the board. And just to mention, um, again, from an, from an example point of view, one of the things that we see is we, we do spend a lot of time working with our members and ask them to report information into the capital markets. But what happens when it gets there, companies say that seems to be a problem. And they don't actually hear this on the quarterly calls. The CEOs have said to us, we'd love to tell our story, but we don't hear it. So some of the simple things we're doing is we're looking at the ratings and rankings industry, which has been blossoming. There's hundreds of raters and rankers, not only from the investment side, but as well as from procurement. You may find that you can't do business with somebody and not know why, because you were rated by some entity with a black box, and all of a sudden you just lost the opportunity to do the business. And so what we're trying to do is dig into that and figure out how do we create that dialogue so companies have some opportunity to anticipate. And then as well, um, creating these analyst calls for CEOs. And then my pet issue, and I'll kind of leave this at this, is um, uh, while well, companies have really done amazing work in engaging their employees on sustainability, um, one of the areas that there's a real gap is on the re in their retirement benefits plans. And uh, CVS is not a member, but just to pick on CVS, for instance, CVS being um, <coughs> a company that came out and said, we're not going to tell, sell tobacco products. And they were beat up a little bit on, uh, by Wall Street on that because it was a big revenue stream for them, right? But are they or have they, with their employees, also said, and you know what, we'll give our employees an option not to have uh, a tobacco company in their 401k. And what we're seeing is that most companies, that seems to be a real gap. And the, the you know, pension committees say they hide behind fiduciary duty and all. But that's that, that I think, is, is, as my former lawyer had on, I would say is, is not a real sound argument. But I think that's where there's a real opportunity. So we, we're starting an initiative to work with companies that are looking at that. Because if we could move 1% of the money under management in retirement plans, that's $23 trillion in the US. 1%, you would flood the market for all the good um, potential products and, and, and opportunities out there. And just to mention, we have a CEO guide to the SDGs. Um, so if anyone's interested, there's a, um, a really good, nice summary of the SDGs. So now is an opportunity. Leadership for the business community can go right or can go left. But what I would say, it's, it's, it's moving forward. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Chris. Um, as always, wonderful and informative.